Okay, as we begin our lesson this morning, I want to point out how in this lesson, as we're moving along, talking about the miracles of Jesus, for our visitors who are here, we've been studying about the miracles of Jesus uh, in our classes for the last few weeks, and we've made our way now to uh, the part of the gospel where the writers tell us about Jesus' power over death. Jesus had the power over death. So as we talk about death, and I realize that talking about death, especially when you consider how much the media and various people have been talking about death the past year due to COVID and different things like that, it can be uncomfortable. Uh, it, it can be an uncomfortable thing even for a preacher to talk about in front of an audience of people. But we need to talk about it because, believe it or not, the scripture gives us encouraging things about death. And so let's talk about that a little bit. Let's start with three things that uh, are important for us to realize about death, biblically speaking. First, death is inevitable. That means it's inevitable. Uh, I think Benjamin Franklin once said there are two things that are guaranteed in life. And what are those things? Death. Death in Texas, right? Well, the Bible puts it this way in Hebrews 9, 27. The Bible also says there are two things guaranteed, but it doesn't mention taxes, although that's true. Uh, but in Hebrews 9, 27, the Bible says it is appointed for men to die once, and after that comes judgment. So the Bible says there are two things that are inevitable, but it's death and it's facing God in judgment. So no matter how much we try to deny it, and we do live in a death-denying culture, we are going to die. We are all going to die. And that brings us to the second thing, and that is death is an equalizer. It's one of life's great equalizers. No matter if you're as rich as Bill Gates or Warren Buffett or Jeff Bezos, no matter if you're as smart as Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, uh, no matter if you're poor, doesn't matter if you're old today or young or whatever. You're going to die. That's one thing. It's one of the things in life that we all have in common. It, it's an equalizer. It brings the poor, the rich, the young, the old, the educated, the uneducated, black, white, Hispanic, Indian. It brings us all together. We're all, we all have that in common. And then a third thing, death is something that strikes fear in a lot of people. Because death is inevitable, because it is an equalizer, and because, because maybe we don't know what it's like to die, obviously, because there's an unknown when it comes to death, people are afraid to die. They're, they are. Most people are just afraid to die. Many Christians are afraid to die. I mean, if you don't believe me when I say that, why do you think some folks don't want to come to service during COVID? They're scared to die. They don't want to get sick and die. Let's just be honest. Can we be honest about it? A lot of people are afraid to die. Christians are afraid to die. They want to go to heaven. They want to be with the Lord. But they just don't want to go right now. And, and, and that's, just, that's just the truth, and we're going to be honest about it. We fall into this trap, too. We fall into the trap of fear of death. Why? Well, because death is unknown. We don't really know what it's like. We believe the Bible. We believe Jesus. We believe in heaven. But I don't know if I want to face death right now. I need a few more years on this earth. I'm not ready to deal with that right now. That's, that's just the truth about it. And, and so that's something we need to bring out. You know, the, after, there have been several polls done on people's greatest fears, and death is always number two on the list, it seems. The only thing people are afraid of more than death is what I'm doing right now. <laughs> it's public speaking. Uh, that has been proven in, in, in many polls. And so now that we brought those things out, let's define death. Let's define it. And when I say death, Please understand I'm talking about physical death, okay? That's the best way I know how to put that. Because the Bible talks about a couple of different kinds of deaths, right? It talks about physical death, and it also talks about what else? Spiritual death. Uh, the spiritual death, when we sin, we're separated from God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they were not only then destined to die physically, but the more important factor was they died spiritually. They were separated from God, and they had to get away from God's presence. And that's what sin does. 
So we're talking about physical death. What is physical death? Is it merely, as some people suggest, especially in the medical world, is it merely when one's heart stops beating? You ever heard someone say, you know, I died five times on the operating table? Well, your heart may have stopped beating. You may have been unconscious and they had to do various things to bring you back, bring you back to consciousness or whatever, or get your heart start to start beating again. But that's not how the Bible defines death. The Bible doesn't define physical death as merely the heart stops beating. Instead, the Bible defines death in this way, physical death. James says it as he talks about faith. And he's trying to give us a good definition of the kind of faith that pleases God. And he says in James 2.26, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works, that is faith without obedience, faith without action, it is dead. So here we see that just like you need faith and works to go together, belief and trust in God with obedience to go together to have the kind of faith that pleases God. Death is biblical. The def definition of death is when one soul or spirit is no longer in their body. It's when this container, this physical container is empty of a soul. That's death. And once that happens, that's permanent until the day of resurrection. Right. So the Bible doesn't say just when your heart stops beating, you are dead. No, as long as that soul is in that body, you're still alive. It is when the spirit or the soul leaves the body. Now you're dead. That's how the Bible defines it. And that is important. That is an important thing for us to emphasize, because once we understand what death is, according to the Bible, then what Jesus does in his ministry becomes even more impressive to us. It becomes something supernatural. It becomes miraculous once we realize that Jesus is reuniting people's souls with their bodies. He's reaching into the realm of Hades, which is where the dead go. He reaches into Hades and he brings the souls out of Hades. He brings the souls out and reunites them with their bodies. That's resurrection. That's what Jesus does. And so we see that in addition to turning water into wine, we've talked about that, right? In addition to walking on water, in addition to calming terrible storms, Jesus even raised the dead. He raised the dead, and he raises the dead at least three times in the Gospels, okay? Now, I know we could add his resurrection on there, and we're going to talk about that towards the end, but I just want to talk about now the three specific instances where we find Jesus in his ministry verifying his identity, raising dead people. He does that. And so we talked about one of these in detail uh, a couple of weeks ago, I believe, when Jesus raised the synagogue official's daughter. What was that guy's name? Remember his name? Jairus. J. Iris. Uh, people <laughs> say it different ways. Uh, but uh, Jairus, he raises his daughter. That girl was 12 years old. And this is the first case of resurrection taking place in the ministry of Jesus. OK. And Peter, James and John were eyewitnesses to this. The widow from Nain's son. We're going to talk about that uh, a little bit in detail in just a moment. Jesus actually performed this case of resurrection at the dead man's funeral. He raised this man at his own funeral. And then Lazarus, probably the most famous case. And this took place towards the end of his ministry, not long before he would be crucified for the sins of the world. Jesus performed at least three cases of resurrection. But let me ask you this, if you don't mind. Is this the only time, is what Jesus does in his ministry the only time we can read about people raising dead people in the Bible? Or are there other times? Are there other times? Let's do this in kind of orderly. Let's, let's do this kind of orderly because I know everybody wants to shout some answers out. Can somebody raise their hand and tell me one example that you can think of off the top of your head where, where somebody raised somebody from the dead? Yes, Tony. Never. Well, that's Jesus doing that one, though. <laughs> so when, when it's not Jesus doing it. When it's not Jesus doing it. Yes, Margie. It was the widow's son, Elijah. Yes. Elijah raised someone from the dead. A widow's son. Absolutely. Somebody else have their hand up? 
Yes. Paul raised the voice of self Paul raised Eutychus. Yes. Anyone else? Maybe one more. Yes, Brother James. Yes, Peter raised Dorcas. And these are happening after Jesus has already done this, right? Lance, yes, sir. Elisha, Elisha, yes, yes. So I wrote these down. Maybe I missed some. Forgive me if I did. The widow from Zerthah's son, that's the case of Elijah raising someone from the dead by the power of God. There is the Shunammite woman's son. She was raised by Elisha. So Elijah and Elisha raised people from the dead. There's Dorcas, as Brother James mentioned. Dorcas is described as a woman who was very influential in the church. She's a kind woman. She was a very charitable woman. She made garments for people. I mean, many Christians really grieved her death. They could feel her, her, her loss. You ever met some people like that in the church where when they die, you can really feel, man, that's a, that's a huge loss right there. We're going to feel that one because these people really made a huge presence in the church. Uh, that's how Dorcas seemed to have been in Peter raised her from the dead before he went to Cornelius and preached the gospel to him uh, and in Caesarea Maritima. There's Eutychus, the great example of Eutychus that gives us a warning against falling asleep in church. <laughs> you fall asleep in church today, you just out of luck because uh, there's no Paul here. Thankfully, that's not a binding example because uh, the Lord's Supper is there. We said that's binding. That's a binding example. We don't bring up Eutychus. That's not a binding example, okay? Uh, but uh, Eutychus dies because he falls asleep in church. He falls from the third loft. Paul, uh, who is, is preaching, he raises him from the dead. So you got Eutychus. And then remember Matthew 27. Remember how the Bible says there were people who were raised after Jesus' resurrection, the Bible says. And these people started going into Jerusalem, and they were being seen all over the place. They were being reunited with family members. And so, unlike... When Jesus walked on water, and unlike the time when Jesus is giving sight to blind people, where you see those things when they are starting, starting to be done, being strictly limited to Jesus for the first time, this was already being done among the people of Israel. This right here was already being done. People knew of cases of resurrection, but they are still a powerful dem demonstration of the Lord's power. So we don't want to minimize that. Say it again, sir. Well, that's a good point. That's a good one. I mean, you know what Mitch is bringing up Acts 14 when Paul is stoned. You know, Mitch, that is an interesting point you bring up there because I've always struggled with that one. You know, usually when people are stoned, what happens? They die. So it could be very likely, like you're saying, Mitch, that Paul does die and the Lord miraculously brings him back to life. That is very possible. Or it's possible that the Lord miraculously just got him through that. I think regardless, the miracle is going on there. Because you don't find people getting stoned <laughs> uh, and living through that. So th that's an excellent point. So now go in your Bible, please, to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 7. Go to Luke chapter 7. I want to talk about this instance when Jesus raises the widow's son from Nain. Now, I'm not going to talk with you about Jairus' daughter because we've already talked about that one in some detail. Uh, but I do want to talk about this one. I really like this one. This may be my favorite one. Uh, and I've told some of you this already. And there, there are reasons why. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 11, and this is somewhat early in the ministry of Jesus, it says in Luke 7, verse 11, soon afterwards, he went to a city called Nain. And this is a small town, small town. And his disciples were going along with him, accompanied by a large crowd. Now, as he approached the gate of the city, a dead man was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. I really want you to pay attention to everything that the Bible is saying here. Luke is trying to really paint a picture in our minds, okay? And let me just say that Luke is the only one that records this, all right? When the Lord saw her, he felt compassion for her, and he said to her, do not weep. And he came up and he touched the coffin, and the barriers came to a halt, and he said, young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man, Luke says, 
the dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him back to his mom. That's important. Luke is saying that for a reason. Fear gripped them all and they began glorifying God, saying a great prophet has arisen among us and God has visited his people. Let's break this down just just a little bit. OK. Notice this miracle, this case of resurrection. Takes place in a town called Nain. Archaeologists have struggled to figure out exactly where Nain was in Israel, but the consensus is this was a small town southwest of Capernaum. Remember, Capernaum was Jesus' hometown. It's where he took up residence as an adult or when he began his ministry. And Capernaum is on the north part of, of the Sea of Galilee. So it appears Nain is about 20 miles southwest of Capernaum. Jesus is not traveling alone. He's traveling, but he's got an entourage with him. The Bible says there is a large crowd of people with Jesus as he is making his way to the city of Nain, to the gates of the city. But as they are approaching the city, they run into something. What do they run into? A funeral procession. That's a funeral procession going on. They run into a young man who has died. And he's going out to be buried. The young man is described as the only son of a widow. That language is important for a couple of reasons. First, that language shows us that this woman, and we, the, the, the woman is really what's highlighted here in the story. The woman. She's already been down this path. She's already been to the cemetery. She's already had to bury somebody. Only the first person she buried was her husband. She's already had to bury her husband. Many of you in here, people I love so much, you've had to bury a spouse before, right? You know what that's like. You know what this woman is going through, don't you? She's, went to, she's had to bury her husband. And now she's going to bury not just a child, that's bad enough, but it's her only son. I've heard from people Many Christians, people I, I love dearly, tell me that there are no words can, that can describe what it feels like to lose a child. That's one of the worst things, and it may be the worst thing that a person can endure in this life. Because it's, it's unnatural, isn't it? Is it unnatural to bury a child? You see a baby come into the world, your child, your seed, your DNA. You hold that baby. You care for that baby. And you don't expect to have to bury that person one day, do you? You expect it to be the other way around, right? They're going to bury you. You're not going to bury them. That's unnatural. And this woman has buried her husband, which happens, and especially today, because usually studies are showing or statistics are showing that men die first in marriages. Not in every case, but that's usually what happens. Women live a little longer, it appears. It, but so that's not really uncommon. That's not unnatural. But this is she's bearing her only son. Now, we need to understand that another reason why this is important to highlight, because. Is highlighting just how bad her situation is. This woman is in a pitiful situation. And, and I say pitiful, not jokingly, but but in sincerity and in, in very much sincerity. This is during a time. That's not like what we got going on here in, a, in, a, in America. There's no welfare. OK, there's no Social Security. There's no leaving your spouse a pension retirement account. During this time, when a, when a husband died, that responsibility to care for the mother was passed on to the son. And when the son dies, especially if it's an only son, guess what happens to the woman? She's destitute. She's completely destitute. So this woman has lost her livelihood. She's lost her husband, the financial security her husband gave her, and now her son is gone. She's in a very pitiful situation, and that may explain this large crowd that's with her. The Bible says she has a sizable crowd with her. She's got an entourage also. A lot of people from this town have come out with her to comfort her and console her. 
they realize how bad her situation is. And our Lord Jesus, he runs smack dab right into it. He runs right into it. He sees this woman going out to bury her only son. And the Bible says he feels what? Oh, I love that, don't you? Jesus has compassion for our problems. He had compassion for, 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 the, for the situation of this woman, even though he knows what he's going to do. Even though he has the power over all things, as Chris said this morning, even though he has the power over death and Hades, he still feels compassion towards our circumstances. He's sympathetic. That makes him perfectly qualified to be our high priest. Now, after Jesus feels compassion for this woman, and we see that language in the Bible a lot, Jesus feels compassion for people. He felt compassion for the multitudes before multiplying the food. But Jesus does something at this funeral that I would never do, and I'm pretty sure you would never do. He does a couple of things. First, he goes up to this woman, he tells her, don't cry. You got the nerve to go to somebody who's grieving, especially the loss of a child, and say, don't cry, don't cry. Is that appropriate? He, exactly. So my point in saying that is we all know, especially in our society, that what we tell people at funerals is it's OK to cry. Let it out. That's what we say. We don't say don't do it. So that's radical. This one was like probably I mean, everybody's here is like, what's this guy talking about? And then the second thing he does is he goes and he touches the coffin. Whoa, that's a big no, no, especially if you hadn't been invited to the funeral. My uncle, somebody was like my brother, he lived in Beaumont, where, where, where Chris preached for a while. He died of cancer. I've told y'all this a few years ago. It's like my big brother, one of the few father figures I had in my life. Cancer just, just tore his body up completely. The chemo really did it, but it was bad. And my grandmother who raised me, she didn't want just anybody going there looking at his body. We had just a few family members in the room, she didn't want people to see him like that. And people were trying to sneak in. They wanted to see the body. And we made sure we guarded them doors. But my grandmother didn't want just anybody seeing the body, let alone she didn't want anybody just touching that coffin. <laughs> you touched that coffin and you had an authority to do so. You, my grandmother wasn't going to be happy about that. You don't touch coffins of people that you're not really acquainted with and you don't have authority to do that. At least that's how we are in the South. I don't know how y'all do out here, but that's how we are in the South. And Jesus touches the coffin. He touches the coffin. So people are probably thinking, this is weird. But they didn't think that in just a, just a little bit, did they? Now we see why Jesus touches the coffin. Now we see why he tells her not to weep, because he says to the young man, arise, which and this is another thing they probably thought was weird. You're telling this guy to arise, he's dead. But after Jesus says arise, what happens? The guy gets up, he doesn't just get up. What else does he do? He starts talking. Wow. This man is up and he's speaking. He has been resurrected. And the people knew that because they responded in three ways. First, the Bible says fear did what to him? Gripped him. Took a hold of him. Fear gripped him. Why did fear grip him? Never seen power like this. If he has the power to raise dead people, what else can he do? Then we see this same thing in our last class when Jesus performed a miracle and the fear grips the people. Fear grips these people. And fear needs to grip us when, when we can stop and consider the power of God. There needs to be godly fear. That's a wise thing. Nothing wrong with fear in God. Jesus even said that in Matthew 10, 28. Mitch brought that up in his invitation. You don't fear those who can just kill the body, but you fear him who's what? able to kill the body and the soul. The Bible says you to fear God. But then secondly, it also says they began glorifying God. And maybe it's the fear that led them to glorifying God. They praise God. They said a great prophet has come among us. Now, they don't say the prophet. They don't call him the Messiah or the son of God, but they know he's somebody from God, right? They know that much because only a man of God can do this. So they said this, this is... This is a glorious moment. God has sent a prophet. In fact, they even said God has visited his people. That language is found in the Bible a few times. It's found in the book of Ruth. Remember after the famine was over and Naomi 
and Ruth are going to make their way into Israel. And the reason why is because by God taking away the famine, the people said God has visited his people. Jesus told the Jews when announcing the destruction of Jerusalem, you miss the day of your visitation. God was among you. You missed it. And these people realized what the most Jews failed to realize is that when Jesus was among them, God was among them or the presence of God and God had visited his people. This is the work of God. And so this is a I mean, this is really just a beautiful, beautiful account here to me. You see so much from Jesus. You see compassion. You see how he said things that may have appeared to be radical at first, but then he backed up his words. And you see how his power immediately convicted people. It was undeniable. It's undeniable. You ever been to a funeral and seen the dead person come out the coffin? You ever seen it happen? That doesn't happen. It never happens. None of us have ever seen that. But it happened on this occasion. And he gave this man back to his mother, the Bible says. Now she has her livelihood, her, her financial security, and her only son back. He blesses this woman. Now, I'm going to give you a chance to say something in just a moment. Let me just highlight this last one real quick. And we're not going to go through this one in big detail. We talked about Lazarus. Lazarus is a great one. I recommend if you were not there for that class, uh, John 11, read John 11, 1 through 45. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. Who was Lazarus related to? They were his sisters. They lived in Bethany, which is not far from Jerusalem. It's south of Jerusalem, I believe southwest. Uh, or maybe southeast of Jerusalem. And uh, when Jesus was made aware that Lazarus was sick, Lazarus was very sick, Jesus said, I'm going to go and see him, but Jesus took his time to go see him. And he does that on purpose. And so by the time Jesus gets there to Bethany, Lazarus is dead. And he had been dead for how long? Four days. Four days. It was, it was obvious he was dead because the Bible says his body was starting to, it was starting to smell. He was dead. And Mary and Martha approached Jesus, and they are just like any sisters would be of a brother they love. They were torn up about it. They were grieving, and that caused Jesus to, to grieve. John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in the New Testament. Jesus wept. Jesus well. Once again, we see the compassion of Jesus, don't we? We, we see the sympathy of Jesus. Jesus knows he's going to raise this man. That's why he took his time getting there. But he still felt the sympathy and sorrow for these women. He loved these people and he, he, he had a heart for them. And there, there are other instances in the scripture we read about Jesus weeping. I think this is one of like three times we can read about Jesus crying. He cried over Jerusalem when he knew, when he knew they were going to be destroyed by the Romans and he announced that. And so Jesus is moved with compassion, but he's not just moved with compassion. He does something to help these people. He does something to take their pain away. He tells the people to remove the stone. Lazarus has been placed in a tomb. A stone is covering the tomb, just like in the case of Jesus. Move the stone. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is unbound, and he comes forth. He's raised after being dead for four days. His body was smelling bad. And so this was a powerful miracle because the scripture says that many of the Jews started believing in Jesus after this. This became a very famous miracle in Israel. It was so famous that the enemies of Jesus, this is when they really start to get nervous. Instead of believing in him like many Jews were doing, they continued to deny him because they didn't like him. And so they're starting to get nervous and they decide that now we really need to get rid of this guy because a lot of people are following him because of what happened with Lazarus, and they're determined to kill not just Jesus, but who else? They said we're going to kill Lazarus too, because he's the evidence of Jesus' power. And so, here's the thing. Jesus is demonstrating great power in his ministry. Power over death. The power to reach into Hades and pull out the victims. But I want you to go in your Bible now to John chapter 10. I want you to go to John chapter 10 because probably the greatest case of resurrection in the Bible is found in Jesus' resurrection. 
Jesus' resurrection. In John 10 and verse 17, after Jesus gives this great sermon about how he's the good shepherd and he knows his sheep and his sheep know him, and he lays his life down for the sheep, he says, John 10, 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I, notice, I may take it up again. Verse 18, no one has taken it away from me. These men, we talk about how they killed Jesus, and, and technically that's true, but they only were able to do that because he allowed them to do that. Does that make sense? He allows them to do it. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This is the commandment, or this is the authority I've received from my Father. So Jesus here is predicting his death and resurrection. I'm going to lay my life down for my people and I will be raised again. But when you read the scripture carefully, and I know you've probably seen this, you really see, and, and going back to what Chris said, about how in the creation you have the Father, Son, Holy Spirit working together. Well, they're working together all through the Bible. They're working together at the creation, like Chris said. They're working together in the scheme of redemption. God creates this great plan to save us from our sins. We read about that, Genesis 3.15. Jesus executes it by going to the cross, dying on the cross for our sins, and the Holy Spirit comes back later and reveals it so we can know it today and know what to do to be saved. But all three persons in the Godhead work together in the scheme of redemption, and they also work together in the resurrection of Jesus. There are times in the Bible where it says the Father raised Jesus. There are times in the Bible where it says the Holy Spirit was involved in this. Romans talks about that. And then here, Jesus says, hey, I, I was in that too. I also had the power to, be, to raise myself. So they're all three working in harmony together even in that, the resurrection of the Lord. But before we close, let's talk about the uniqueness of Jesus' resurrection. Because we've talked about all these different cases of resurrection in the Bible. They're Old Testament, they're New Testament, they're all over the place. But Jesus is unique to all the other cases. There are four reasons why. First, his was predicted. Over and over again, he's telling people, I'm going to die and be raised. I'm going to be resurrected, and he's very precise, on the third day. John 2, you tear this temple down, in three days I will build it back up. He's talking about his body there. You read Matthew 16, you read here, John 10, it's all over the place. Jesus is predicting his resurrection. You don't find that in the other cases. Secondly, he was raised to never die again. Eutychus, when he, after he was raised by Paul, has anybody seen a Eutychus sighting anywhere? Eutychus is dead. He died again. Lazarus died again. Dorcas died again. The Shudamite woman's son. He died again. The son of the widow from Nain, he died again. When Jesus was raised, he never died again. He was ascended right into heaven where he reigns at the right hand of God. He didn't face death again. He conquered it once and for all. Paul says in Romans 1 and verse 4 that the resurrection of Jesus declares him to be something, declares him to be the son of God. The greatest piece of evidence we have that Jesus is who he claimed to be is found in the resurrection. Someone says, no, it's in the crucifixion. Well, if Jesus wasn't raised, how do we know that God was pleased with that sacrifice? If Jesus wasn't raised, how do we know that everything else he said is true? Because anybody can say the stuff Jesus said. People do it all the time. But the way we know that his sacrifice was pleasing, the way we know his moral standard is the right standard is ultimately found in the resurrection because God's not going to raise a liar from the dead. That's the point. God's not going to raise a man who was a sinner and saying, I want to be the Lamb of God. He's not going to raise that kind of man from the dead. The resurrection is the ultimate proof that Jesus is the Son of God, and his resurrection impacts everybody. Unlike the other cases, because Jesus was raised, you know what that guarantees? Salvation, ultimately, that you're going to be raised. You're going to be raised one day. And you're going to be raised with an indestructible, incorruptible spiritual body. That's Paul's, one of his main points in 1 Corinthians 15, that if you deny the resurrection of Jesus, you're denying your own resurrection. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then guess what? Then we shouldn't even preach the gospel. We shouldn't be baptizing people. 
we just live a pitiful life. Jesus' resurrection guarantees that we're going to be raised, that heaven is real, and that we're going to be given spiritual incorruptible bodies before going to heaven. So, any other, and give me one more minute. Chris, we're going to blame Chris for this. Chris, it's your fault on this one. Um, any, com <laughs> any more comments, any comments about that before we close? Anything? Yes, done. The word weak that we looked at. Yes, sir. In the Greek, that's only one word. So you've got to do a little bit of interpretation like I've been talking about in the blog. That could just as easily be even telling her there's no need to be. As it is talking. And so when you look at, at the outcome, there's no need to weep because I'm going to raise him up. He's not dead. Don, if that's true, you took away my whole point. I, that took away a great point I was trying to. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Could be true. No. Thanks a lot, Don. You should have told me that in private. No, I'm joking. All right, let's stop right there. Um, thank you for your uh, interest in spiritual things, and thank you for studying with me this morning. I appreciate it.